today we're talking about emotional intelligence, which is very much about the education of children. And that flows directly into our programs in art therapy and art education. So, comprehensively, I'm interested in everything everybody has to say here. Well, this is an important conference. It's the fourth in a series that the Foundation for Human Potential has been arranging here at the Art Institute. It's a very interesting idea. It looks at the intersection between the sciences, particularly the neural sciences, and things to do with expression in the brain, as, uh, as we call art and music and dance and performance, etc. Intelligence can be defined in many ways. Each of us is smart in our own way. In December 1997, the Foundation for Human Potential presented a symposium that was attended by nearly 1,000 educators and professionals. They were all interested in how the latest research on emotional intelligence and the brain may be influencing assumptions and practices in education. The day-long meetings brought together a unique guest faculty of academics and practitioners. Professor Howard Gardner of Harvard University Graduate School of Education. Professor Mihai Chiksant Mihai, psychologist, University of Chicago. Professor Antonio Damasio, neurologist, University of Iowa. Jacques D'Amboise, founder of the National Dance Institute in New York and former lead principal dancer of the New York City Ballet. Professor K. Redfield Jameson of Johns Hopkins University School of Medicine, Department of Psychiatry and Professor Joseph Ledoux, NYU Center for Neuroscience. This videotape, SMARTS, introduces you to a few of the people and ideas that the Foundation for Human Potential believes are critical as we question our assumptions and plan for the future of our educational system. Superficial measures as IQ, grades, SAT scores, provide limited predictive value in terms of who makes meaningful contributions to humanity. That the notion of there single, being a single virtue called intelligence is, um, it's, it's really, it's, a, it's, an intel, it's an intellectual dodge of um, a whole variety of, of capacities, which I think properly should be differentiated from one another. Our school is founded on the idea of multiple intelligences and all of Dr. Gardner's work and we're, we've been working together for five years implementing it and it was a chance for us all to see him together so we thought it was well worth the trip for our in-service this year. It's sort of like climbing the mountain to see your guru. <laughs> tell us what a school is that's founded on multiple intelligence. Well, it's a school that pays um, equal uh, time in the curriculum to all the different aspects of the in intelligences that he has identified, not just verbal and math like we've traditionally done. So many of us have 25 years of experience of teaching in more traditional schools and we've taken this opportunity to work in a school that emphasizes music and bodily kinesthetic and interpersonal and interpersonal and naturalistic and spatial intelligence as well as verbal and math intelligence. Does it work? We think so. Uh, We're only five wonderful. years into it. so <laughs> I teach the preschool and so I have children two and a half through five. And what happens there is that the younger children see the modeling of the older children and those children that are capable of working at a higher level then choose to do that and see themselves as a success, a success there. The other situation that might occur are the children who are older who are yet not developmentally ready to do some of the higher functions see themselves as being part of a group that's you know, ranges from all, you know, on a continuum, a developmental continuum. So they see themselves successful in that classroom and they continue to strive to, in order to succeed. There's not a, we don't have a, a high failure rate in that situation. You don't, sounds like you don't have a lot of assumptions about what they can and can't do when they want The only out. assumption that we have is that they can do whatever they can do as long as it's there for them to do it. In fact, we yeah. have children that will literally cry when their parents pick them up and say, I want to stay at school, please let me stay at school. That's now that's a, a change. And we all know that there are some kids about whom hyperactivity or attentional deficit disorder is easily uh, issued as a label who will spend hours at a computer terminal playing video games or things like this. And I think some of the societies which are much um, less likely to endorse those labels actually end up having um, less manifestations of the, uh, of the pathology than those in which it becomes something to look for and alas, as, as Kay was describing, often an easy way to get rid of a problem because it's easy to give somebody a pill that to think very hard about things that can go on in, in, in the classroom or in any kind of environment which is <coughs> engaging and stimulating and which encourages you to focus your attention rather than to diffuse it. We have a school in New York, the Idelson School, and it's for emotionally disturbed children. And one of our board members secretly, anonymously, underwrote 
that school, so we would have a dance program in that school. <clears throat> Maybe about eight years now. Now these children, there's about 30 or 40, they live in that school 24 hours a day. Then there's another maybe 30 or 40 that come and stay, but they have a, some kind of home they can go to. These are very, very disturbed, emotionally charged, stressed children. Attention span is about 15 seconds on most of them. The staff is almost one-on-one. -on -one. There was this little boy, I can't remember his name, I think it was Michael. Michael. Beautiful little boy, pale white skin, about 11. Thin, few little freckles and piercing blue eyes. And we have these children, I'd say, can you bring that, that class down of five or six children and bring those four or five over here? And we would try and start a dance class with them. And it would be hard, the first class, just to get them up off the chair or the floor or climbing the wall. And Michael would, and I said, what's your name? And the teacher came over and said, oh, oh, he doesn't speak, uh, but his name is Michael. And I said, hi, Michael. And he gives me a hand and a kind of smile. And he's ground his teeth away. He has a big gap in his teeth. I'm grinding. Now, we start a step. Can anybody, well, first of all, I have to take the magic chalk. Make a circle. This is my space I put my initial in. Here, take the magic, you put yours. Everybody, look in your pocket. You'll find a piece of chalk. So they all make a circle. Can you jump out of it? Jump back in. Do like I did. Oh, but you went to the left. I went to my right. Oh, but you didn't lift your legs. Finally, I get them doing it. Michael is trying. Not only trying, he's the best. Right? No one can believe it, that he's spending that much attention. When he was about two, he was in a crib, and his father shot his mother right in front of him and shot himself. And then he laid in that crib, screaming and crying for days, till finally someone from the smell came in. And he hasn't spoken since. <coughs> we worked with him. And that year we had a program, uh, and I had about 1,200 children to get on stage in about three minutes. It's an enormous space, and we gridded the floor, and it come running like trains coming into a station through different tracks. And at a certain time, Idelson School comes running in, jumps, <laughs> runs along the red line, runs to this square, and starts to dance until. And Idelson School comes, and they get in the wrong spot. Instead of the blue box, they're in the green blocks led by Michael. <laughs> and I'm sitting, and I jump to my feet, and I run half a block down, and I go up to him and I say, you're in the wrong box, Edelson. Move to your left, move to your left, move to your left. And Michael is <laughs> And then he says, I'm so happy. Oh, thank you, I'm so happy. I stopped everything. I didn't say move to the box. I didn't care if the whole thing collided. <coughs> we had to go back. It took us a half hour to get everybody back and redo it. The whole program was worth it. It was a breakthrough. Why? We caught his emotion. We don't need to be sorting kids. We need to be um teaching kids that once they don't reach a field of a, a mastery of a or some degree of understanding that we can they can go back on the journey and assimilate other experiences so until they understand and we should teach for learning teach for understanding and not just teach it once and say well you didn't get it you're an F and you're not going on but to say wow you didn't get it what else can I do to make your experience more meaningful for you so that you come to understand it if you look 
across the country, you'll find out that the highest subscribed to uh, pro professional development classes have to do with classroom discipline. A quick way to fix discipline in my classroom to make it easier for me. My contention is that we should spend more time and more money on making our instruction rich and our curriculum rich. So therefore, see, I, I in my evaluation of teachers, I was able to, to point out the factors areas where there is no management problems are areas where there's a strong relationship between quality curriculum and quality instruction. At least for normal children, the problem is not that they cannot learn. Uh, the problem is they don't want to learn because the learning is presented in a way that they either are bored or anxious rather than experience this state of optimal involvement, which uh, ideally would be there um, in every learning experience and which you can find among um, creative people. On the one hand, our culture is in awe of the achievements of science um, as they reveal more and more detailed information about uh, how galaxies are put together, what happened uh, at the first nanosecond of creation billions of years ago. Uh, we are in awe about the detailed information about how the brain is put together and how it works. And yet, on the other hand, an increasingly large number of people in our culture are spending their time and money trying to find uh, spiritual solace in ancient and seemingly discredited beliefs based on astrology, reincarnation, so one of the things that I, I am curious about is this, uh, the reasons for this uh, schizoid relationship we have with science. Um, on the one hand, uh, taking it for granted and admiring it and feeling awe for it, and on the other hand, um, um, often in our everyday life, uh, giving precedence to forms of approaching reality which are in many ways opposite to what science would uh, endorse or, or accept. It's not reason versus emotion. It is not the cultural acquisitions that give us ethical behavior versus the emotional uh, machinery that leads the social behavior in the squirrel or in the wolf in the jungle. Uh, the fact is that these two things are constantly interwoven because at any given time, we are making, uh, whether we want it or not, we are having reactions of an emotional type to the facts that are being presented to us. So when you look at an object, uh, you may think that you're looking at it very objectively, but at any given time in your life, and quite variedly according to your develop, development over the years, you're going to react to that object in an emotional way. We can begin to see the broad outlines of at least how an emotional reaction is triggered. We aren't anywhere near the point of being able to understand where feelings come from um, or where, how we, uh, once we're in, this, in an emotional state, how we actually decide what to do and, and make a plan and uh, carry it out. These are much more complex things than I think we understand at this point. So I'm going to keep it very simple. Uh, but I think that you know, we have to move beyond our narrow conceptions of topics like fear, emotion, thought, reason, all of these things, we need to put it into a broader perspective and understand how the mind works, how emotions and thoughts and all of the, these things come together, how we actually, how ourselves are uh, coming out of the brain. At this point, we have brain theories of specific processes, but we have no theory of the self, and I think that's where the future uh, needs to move. Thank you very much. Understanding neurobiology and understanding how uh, human brains are put together and operate is something that may be helpful uh, in order to get a better view of the mind and a better view of behavior, but let's not kid ourselves that we're going to solve uh, problems uh, alone from the point of view of neurobiology. I think that we, uh, as I pointed out, 
over and above a lot of the things that are uh, neatly packaged by evolution in one's brain, you have a whole edifice of culture, and the only solution to these problems, from the point of view of understanding them and eventually giving them some, uh, some satisfaction, is to bring together sciences that are both the sciences of biology, the traditional sciences of the mind, and the social sciences. Thank you very much. And just what I heard here today about the integrated brain, you know, as a teacher, I've known this all, as a practitioner, I've experienced this in classroom, but now I have like the backup singers, the researchers, now they're backing me up because I'm the one in the front lines trying to implement this and translate it in the classroom. They're the backup boys, and they're the ones who are giving me, for example, multiple intelligences, that IQ is not fixed, that I can change IQ. Before, when I used to say that, I was just talking through my hat. Now I have Howard Gardner's research to back me up. So, to end everything at this point, uh, when you teach, invent ways to capture the emotions of the children. Make games of them. Play um, engaging emotion are the best ways of learning. learning. Thank you. But this is only the beginning. Understanding how emotional intelligence and the brain affect education is an exciting and important area for cross-disciplinary study. The Foundation for Human Potential is on the leading edge of this work. For more information, please contact Andrea Gellin Schindler at 847-853-9881.